Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, listeners, colleagues and friends. Here we are again, another weekend, which means another week has flown past. Stephen, lovely to see you again. A little bit later than usual, but lovely to see you, my friend. How are you? I'm good, thank you, Chris. Yeah, it's uh, Sunday evening here, man. So, yeah. um, as, uh, as, as you know, we, we, both, had, we both had domestic um, uh, chores and challenges this week that prevented us getting together yesterday, but, um, but no, ready to go. Yeah, we did indeed. I had a lovely, lovely uh, few days golf with my son, so absolutely superb. Well, I, wouldn't, I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't call that a domestic chore then, really. That, that, was, no, a, that, was, a, that was a pleasure. It was indeed, it was indeed, and especially as the two of us almost won everything on the table, so it was great. Did you, did, was, was, was the shirt the, uh, the booby prize and the, and the four ball? No, 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 I like to bring a little bit of colour into everybody's life, so, you know what I'm saying? That, I think that's especially for Miss Gregory at Qantas again. It is indeed, yeah, yeah, I'm, wait, I'm waiting for her to comment <laughs> on it, and uh, I won't say anything about yours again, but uh, fair place, making a second oh, this, appearance. This is, this, is, this is making a second appearance, indeed, yeah. Yeah, back by yeah. popular demands. Absolutely. Right, Stephen. This week, right, news, news, news. So now, I think one of the one of the areas I'd like to touch base with you on, and I know you've been involved in in similar issues, is whenever there's tough decisions that have to be made, management has to take a certain stance, and obviously the personnel, unions, everybody, they need to protect themselves as well. But I think over the past. And, and history has repeated itself. People can make the wrong decisions for the, ro the wrong decisions for the wrong reasons and the wrong decisions for the right reasons. Yeah. Now, one of the examples I'd like to I'd like to focus on, and I know you've got some very very um, open opinions on it, is British Airways and the way things have gone with British Airways and IAG. And now on Friday there was the announcements of you know redundancies and. People waiting to see if they still kept their job and did they make the right decision by not taking voluntary. And then you've got the difference between how the uh, cabin crew and the pilots reacted. So now just a little bit of background from your perspective as to how things should possibly change now moving forward and what this crisis has done to make people start to look at both sides of the coin, irrespective of where the pain is going to come. Well, I think, look, I mean, uh, it, it, the, the, the example or the proxy that we use is the British Airways, um, you know, uh, uh, changes that have resulted in, in, you know, mass redundancies. And I think, um, I think you know, they're, they're not alone, quite clear. There's massive amounts of change yep. of flux in the, in the, in the industry. And, and British Airways is one of many airlines that, is, that has had to, to, to go into survival mode, batten down the hatches. And have some very frank conversations with amongst themselves at management, but also uh, between the management and the employee group. Now, employees, um, you know, are are always slightly cautious of management. Um, there is a a healthy um, healthy degree of sort of um, question or contest between between the two groups, and and that's 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 borne out over trust. Um, and I must say, it's not in every organisation, but in large organisation that employ 20, 30, 40,000 people upwards, you know, that, there, is a, there, is a, there is a large gap between the guy sitting in the, in the, in the, glass, the glass office, um, you know, on the top floor of his office building and the, and the chap who works 12 hour shifts on the ramp or on the, or on the cargo terminal or, or wherever else. So, you know, that, that, that caution is, 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 is often commonplace. I think what's happened here at British Airways specifically though, Chris, is that the, the mistrust Yep. Um, that has obviously been born out of previous events or 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 some some you know some specifics with between management and unite specifically previously has meant actually that from from the get go unite were on the back foot they tried to be on the front foot they tried to they tried to galvanize public support they tried to galvanize support from the members of parliament the house of commons they tried to uh, get the government to intervene in what would have been unprecedented the government doesn't intervene in private sector you know, decisions about how they run their business. Likewise, private sector does not involve themselves in directly, uh, you know, intervening or, or, or they can make representations, but not intervening in, in government uh, business. So I think, I think the strategy from Unite's perspective was all wrong. What they tried to do was actually kind of, you know, fly the flag and get, and get that British flag out there and say, you know, how dare British Airways call themselves a British airline? How dare they still be, you know, the dominant player at Fortress Heathrow? You know, we need to be. You know, this behaviour is uncalled for and unasked. And of course, at that time, of course, as you know, it, we've moved on from from early March to now in 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 you know uh, almost middle of August. 
um, you know that um, that they haven't they haven't changed their tax. You compare that, Chris, to the professionalism that has been shown by the pilots' union, Balpa, um, who were faced with the same threats. By the way, I mean, sorry, not threat. I mean, not threat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to knock you, knock you out, pal. Yeah. But, but threats as in threatened by their ongoing employment, threatened by a change of conditions, threatened by, you know, last in, first out conditions, threatened by changes to terms of conditions, seniority, basing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, fleet decisions. So. Those threats were consistent across all of the employee groups in British Airways, whether you were a Knight, a Unite member worker, you know, in Terminal 5, or you were a Knight member worker as a, you know, a CS, um, CSM in, in Mixed Street or elsewhere. But the difference in approach, Balpa went about their business quietly, they went about it diligently. Um, you saw a little bit of press from the pilots' union, but that was to, to get out some messaging that they thought was right at the right time. But what Balpa have, have, have managed to secure is, going from a position where you know, a couple of thousand pilots at British Airways would lose their jobs to actually really changing the, the, the dial, turning up the dial in terms of their engagement and changes to their, to their production rates, changes to collective agreements that will result in a much better unit cost base, changes that also ensure the guys at the bottom come back into the business when the jobs become available again. As a result, Chris, there's only, I think, 140, 160 jobs that, 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 that pilots will lose and they'll be brought back in when the volume dials back up. You contrast that with the 10,000 redundancy notices that were issued across the cabin crew um, uh, 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 ranks, which, which just, you know, now cabin crew, obviously a larger work group, so you'd expect the numbers to yeah, be yeah. Yeah, of course. multiples of the pilots, absolutely. Um, however, you know, standing outside um, uh, Waterside, an empty, an empty complex, because Waterside essentially been mothballed. There's, there's, there's nobody working there with their, with their placards and their flags has sadly, has sadly backfired. But it's, uh, it, it, I think it's, I mean, obviously it's, it's we're, we're just giving our own opinions and giving some comment, but for people, you know, that are losing their livelihood, et cetera, it's, it's a terrible thing, no matter who's representing them. But I think, Stephen, now people have got to start to look at what they're getting. If you look at some of the fringe benefits and some of the, you know, some of the ways, and I'm a lot older than you, I remember, I remember the good old days and they, they always say the older you get, the better it was. Um, but, you know, some of the things that were happening when I started, they just could not happen now. And if people try and cling on to that, it's almost like a drowning man well, bringing everybody else down. Well, what's happened as a result, because they've clung on to those things, the commuting rosters, for example, I mean, you know, when, when we heard MPs saying that they've got constituents, you know, who are, you know, large groups of British Airways cabin crew in their, in their constituency, and you find that constituency is in Bury or, um, you know, or South Yorkshire, or you should say, here lies the problem, folks. What, why are the large numbers of British Airways cabin crew commuting from, well, historically that might have been possible yeah. and acceptable. And, uh, and we've all got friends that probably were commuters and, and, uh, you know, and, and took advantage of it at the time. But, but their, their bloody-mindedness, and I say this having spoken to some of the British Airways cabin crew, who are very upset with Unite, actually wanted a refund of their subs, because they thought, they thought what Unite was trying to do, actually, was dig their heels into the ground such that they retained as few jobs as possible with the best possible conditions. So rather than, rather than kind of all for one, one for all, this is about protecting those at the top um, largely, rather than actually, you know, uh, displacing from a, uh, the, some of the benefits from across the the fleets, the mixed fleet yeah. and worldwide fleet. Because and, and a lot of it is hearsay, because actually we don't know what went on exactly between the negotiators and the, on both sides of the table. But I suspect that if we, if you were able to share and amortise some of the some of the changes across the work group, you'd have ended up with less people made redundant and more people still in jobs. Although maybe with slightly more compromised um, compromised allowances or or, or fringe benefits. Exactly, exactly. But it's definitely, it's definitely something that people have got to start to take into account now moving forward because for the next several years, the sustainability and continuity is going to be something that's more important than, than uh, of course it is. benefits. And, 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 this, and, this, and this caution, Chris, or this, this, um, this scepticism that exists about you know, the management aligned to us, the management not to us the truth, or British Airways has got all this cash in the bank. Actually, yeah, look, I'm not an accountant, um, but actually I, I had, you know, sitting here somewhere, I had the um, the IEG results presentation. I packed it away now in the file, but um, but you know it doesn't doesn't take much to to re read the B the BAP and L and make a make a quick forecast that actually that cash 
is not finite. And, yes. um, and you know, decisions need to be made now, not for now, but actually ensure survivability in three, four, five years' time. Yeah. And uh, we've actually, we actually had, uh, well, I've had quite a few um, snippets of feedback and questions, but the ones that are the main ones now, and it seems to be get, gathering up a nice, a nice breeze, is this one about, you know, if, if strong decisions have to be made, and a lot more people are starting to realise now that there, there has to be, because they're seeing things in their everyday life that's being affected. So what they're saying is, if these decisions have to be made, and they're as tough as they are, how do you keep the people that have been displaced, and I quote, the positive and the engaged members? How do you keep them involved so that when things do start coming back, that they, they're the ones who are invited well, first and foremost? Well, I think, Chris, well, the, the example that we can use, it's real. Again, we don't have specific numbers because we've, we've seen something published by Balp and something confirmed by British Airways. But, but let's assume it's around... The, the bulk have, have closed their deal on the pilots for BA. Um, I think the number was about 140, 150 pilots that would be made redundant or subject to, to, to exit. But, you know, that what they committed to was bringing those guys back on board at a time that there was a, there was a slot for them. So obviously, what between Valpa and the business, they have to set up a system to ensure those 140, 150 people remain in contact, that, yep. that, they, that they can feel part of part of the broader community and still engage. So I suspect that there's work there required to, to you know, um, I don't think they'll maintain recency or occurrence in terms of license provisions, but, but you know, keeping, keeping a connection between management and the worker. Remember, the worker, the employee, the, the person is, is part of the company organization, not the union organization. Correct, and this correct. Is the, like, whereas the union always think, well, they're my member. It's like, well, actually, they, they pay subscriptions to you, but actually they're employed and they're paid by the, the firm. So it's for the firm to take the lead here, not the union, I would suspect. Although, you know, um, you know I, think, I think there's different ways to skin the cat, but I'd be ensuring things like, you know, well-being groups and community, community um, you know, extra nets or, or yep. these type of events yep. that you can keep them involved. The pilot community is a fairly tight-knit one anyway, so they tend to, they tend to probably have a, have, a, have, a, have a better ability to kind of, you know, maintain that. But, I think it's important that, 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 they, that, they, that they do that. What it should also do, of course, is ensure, when it's possible, that there is some face time re reintroduced back to the system. Yeah. Um, you know, these people are probably, you know, I've seen stories of British Airways pilots, sorry, this whole thing should be about BA, but it is kind of, it's kind of representative of what's going on around the world. Um, you know, BA pilots going off working for Ocado or Tesco as delivery drivers. And I think that's wonderful to see, and this, you know, really testament to, one, that these guys, you know, that are juniors, um, despite, you know, you know, public misconception, they're not paid a fortune. Uh, the second thing is each of them probably got 70, 80 K of debt or upwards of that over their, yeah, over their training. Just, Steve, so, I've had some, I've had some that are way over a hundred and they've yeah. you know, remortgaged and everything. So I feel terrible for them. So um, I but, think that's important, but you know, and, and FaceTime is important, but also, also just to make sure that's sort of that camaraderie that has maybe not existed over the last couple of months because we've seen being in this sort of in a state of flux and there has been this, this need to be sitting on you know, one side of the table from your employer. Now that that's kind of gone by, you know, you know through, through a lot of hard work and negotiation, now that you've secured a deal, now is the time actually to get back on the same side of the table and start to work out this, 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 this sort of plan going forward. Yeah, 100%. And, and like this, you know, this thing about you know, people saying now, if companies have to make tough decisions, be good, be quick, bring us back. And I think that's, yeah. that's a nice little slogan that we should all be trying to push for and try and get people uh, you know, to do yeah. the right thing. Now, following on from that same theme, got a message here from Lisa, and this is actually to, to us. And it's, uh, why not create a recovery club of like-minded business organizations so that you can share resources, be more effective, be more efficient, mm -hmm. and bring people back sooner rather than later? So what do you think, Steve? Like We're going to start a club, I, my friend. I, I, I like that idea, Lisa. Um, a recovery club. I, I, yeah, I'm kind of energised by that. Um, it was something we touched on a few weeks ago, Chris, with those, with the, with the, um, you know, trying to sort of uh, get together a group of pilots. If you remember, or this audit yeah, yeah. capability, yeah. Uh, which is something we we need to kind of start to communicate. I know you've been working in the background on that, so it's something to, to start yeah. to communicate and work out how we do it specifically. But um, no, look, I like this. I like the thought of 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 like-minded people getting together in a, in a, in a group. Uh, the analogy I always use, as you know, Chris, is kicking the ball on the same, same side of the, uh, the park. 
you know, um, and making sure that actually what we're trying to do is aligned. And a lot of this, a lot of this actually is about trying to uh, understand what this means going forward. So where are the recovery options? Where are the solutions? What are the systems that we need to kind of encourage? Where are the businesses that might benefit from a bit of pro bono consulting or help That's it. to help yeah. to re-energize them? Where is the where is the support that we can lend to the likes of um, you know the you know, government groups or lobby groups or whatever that that need a bit of technical expertise within there? So practical solution design rather than strategies. Yeah, you know, there, there, there was a time for strategizing, but I think now is a time for a bit more a bit more action and less yep. talk. And yep. so um, in forming such a group, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's some, some potential outcomes there are that, that you can get some really good people with strong technical capabilities to actually just, just, just say it as it is. This is not, you know, despite what everybody wants to say about our industry, it ain't all that complicated. People yep. want to think, people want you to think it's complicated. They want the layman to think it's complicated to, to protect themselves, to protect their job to protect their IP, actually, it's not all that difficult. Yeah, so, no. you know, getting, getting some people together that, that have got an approach that want to share some of that best practice with others would be, I think, um, I think potentially, potentially a nice thing. Yeah, well, I followed up and uh, I spoke to Doug. I sent him a message saying I'm going I'm to try and get a little bit of his assistance in the next couple I think, of weeks. Yeah, I, think, I think Captain Brown would be a great, would be a great podcast for you as well, Chris. Yeah, no, we're going uh, to do it and especially to, you know, to hear his opinions as well knowing what, what he's been through in his career. But also, um, I'm waiting now for some responses from some of the representative bodies. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks, I'd like to get somebody on who's, who's standing behind it. Now, another similar issue, which is to do with the recovery club and also be good, be quick, bring us back, is again about training. I've had so many people and um, from all over, Steve, calling saying they're being bombarded with emails about training and online training and webinars and everything and the quality just isn't there but the most important thing is it's not training to allow people to be able to do something practically different as soon as they've done the training it, it so much of it is theory and like you just said that's not what people need now no, it's practical solutions you know that that's gonna that's gonna 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 gonna, gonna win the day here you know we we don't Number one, in terms of consulting and training, you could put them in a similar bag, but, but training, training is, is, is you know, a mandatory requirement in many regards um, for many of the programs and license roles in our industry. Um, for a lot of the management roles, however, Chris, I, I would hazard a guess that not every business um, would, would put their management through mandatory training because one, they'd expect managers to be relatively experienced and competent, Let's come back to, to, to how we ensure that main, is maintained in the future. Yep. The, sec yep. the second thing is um, they would see an opportunity potentially now because of this crisis to reduce some of that training if it were there uh, uh, you know, previously. And I've been you know, engaged with companies and clients who, who, who it would be inappropriate to mention who you know, for the rank and file, for those, for those, you know, for those um, what, what I call the grafters, right? Who, uh, I, mean, I like to think that I still do a bit of graft now and then, but um, but some some may say otherwise. But for the real grafters, you know, whether it's it's operationally in the cabin, pilots and cabin crew, or it's engineers, or it's the the ramp and baggage handling staff, or the or front of house staff, or the cargo, you know, yeah, everybody, yeah, 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 yeah. The, there's very defined, clear training requirements, either because of a regulatory need or because of a company to demonstrate competence. Um, to win contracts for clients and so on and so forth, right? So that's, uh, those, are, those are ticking boxes. The optional training for those roles, I suspect, Chris, is actually where it really matters now, which is about, you know, upskilling, leadership training, development yep. of the people, identified talent, how do you bring people forward, what, you know, conflict, conflict conversations, difficult, you know, uh, negotiation, for example, you know, um, people leadership, HR 101, a lot of that stuff uh, will probably fall by the wayside, I think. And that's not, that's not because I think that's the right thing. It's because the reality is today, Chris, the optional training that, that doesn't directly deliver value in terms of maintaining a contract win, for example, for a ground service provider, or maintaining a license or recency or currency for a pilot, cabin crew, or engineer. Well, those are, that's directly relatable. Yeah, I mean, you need pilots that are licensed to fly. Actually, me or you or the ramp manager or the head of operations or the, or the terminal manager in the in the cargo shed 
and the horseshoe. Does does he need does he need that management leadership training? Does he need the kind of the difficult conversation for staff? To, does he need the? I suspect not. But what what we all need to do as a business right now is actually is is not take our foot off the gas with training, but actually apply some more focus and some more pressure, in my view, because actually with the skills gap that we're creating from losing people at the top end, um, and with the enthusiasm and kind of fire in the belly that we're losing at the bottom end, I mean that in terms of, not in terms yeah, yeah, of rank yeah, yeah. importance, I mean in terms of, ex of years and years of service, right? Because um, there's generally more fire in the belly of somebody who's three years into their career than the rest of somebody that's 35 years in. Um, you and I will have seen many of those. Well, there's a couple of them at that end, but not, not many. But yeah, 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 no, no. The importance is, I talk about this squeezed middle, and it's the squeezed middle that are going to see us through this. And those are the ones that, that leadership capability and supervision uh, um, uh, and kind of, you know, giving them a good leg up to be good managers and good leaders in the absence of their mentors, their peers that are no longer there is really important. So let's cut the crap. Let's cut the kind of the, 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 the nonsense in terms of this theoretical stuff. Yes, let's do the mandatory training. Let's do it properly and find a way to do that more cost efficiently through, you know, much yeah, yeah, more, exactly. more virtual solutions. But we also need to consider how do we keep up? How do we keep up with the with the what you might have seen as optional training to maintain to maintain that um, you know overall kind of uh, you know sort of holistic approach? That that's what I think is really important. So I, I hear you. I think it's important we need to find a way to do it. And I'm sure lots of I'm sure there are lots of good examples out there. I'm sure some of our listeners could tell us. But um, as as a whole, I suspect that we've we've neglected that in the industry before. Yeah, yeah, but I, I, I totally agree. It's got to be readdressed and learning for leaders because people who are going to take it forward, they have to do things totally differently now. Yeah. And, this, yeah. and I'm, I'm definitely now, I'm going to do a paper. I might even get you involved with this crisis to care because the care concept now involves everybody. And I think everybody now has got to care about what happens to their department, what happens to their own personal performance, what happens to their division, what happens to their group, everything, because if they don't, the collective results will affect everybody even worse. So they, yeah, they've yeah, got yeah. to start to do it. So Stephen, something we should do there definitely together. Now, some other, an, an, another area uh, is this like, know your home. Okay, so when you start to see what's happening now around the world with the domestic markets picking up and picking up quite substantially, um, and even myself, I've now traveled to a few places in the UK. I haven't been to for God knows how long. And they are absolutely... I've seen, I've seen the photographs, Chris. It, look, it looks spectacular. They are, but it's amazing. And, and you know, this, this know your own home or this, you know, uh, staycations and stuff. I think it's, it's a great idea now for people to... We get should look, I've been back. doing that for... Yeah. Huh? I, I was, I've been doing staycations for years, Chris, because... Um, because I travel so much, um, you know, actually spending time with the family here in Malaysia now, thankfully, is great. But I also, I also love traveling across the UK, particularly in the West Country, which I know you were, you were, you were down in the Southwest, yeah. um, and it was delightful. Um, there are parts of, uh, it, it, it's sad to sort of admit, there are parts of the UK that my in-laws have visited that I've never been to, particularly in Scotland. Um, and Ramani's parents, my wife's parents here from Malaysia, have seen more of more of Eile and Mull and, um, you know, the north of Scotland, Wick and, and uh, Wick. Kirkwall, than, than I've ever been to, Chris. So I'm ashamed to, look, this is a great thing. Um, but let, let, let's, let's also remember that domestic travel, so whilst people are looking at sort of, you know, getting domestic travel, you know, back up and running, which that's an easy thing to do because it doesn't require cross-border, um, cross-border sort of, uh, you know, uh, issues. Uh, yeah. unless, you're, unless you're Nicola Sturgeon, um, I say here with my mum um, in front of me, but um, who, who, who she would she would argue with herself in the mirror. Um, but <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but my goodness me! All right, fair play. Say it as it is, my friend. Yeah. Um, but look, domestic travel is great, Chris. However, let's let's be clear: it doesn't generally use a lot of airlines in the UK. It doesn't need a lot of airline travel in the UK because. Uh, we've got such a, uh, you know, uh, yeah. some people might disagree, but I think the rail system is fantastic and our road network is pretty good. Um, except if you go into Newquay, that's a pretty, pretty um, tough drive. Then down, down, down right there to the bottom end, into Rock or, or Bodmin or somewhere. But look, um, uh, it's certainly good to get people back spending money in, yep. in the economy. I think the other thing that, that's fantastic is I read a report yesterday that, um, that here's Rishi, um, Chancellor Sunak, getting another mention. 
but um, Dishy Rishi, as my wife would refer to him, um, has she never referred to me as, as Dishy Dishy Dicko, but um, never mind. No, no, let's stay, stay. Let's stay. Stay. Let's, let's not go there, my friend. Come on. <laughs> um, the the, the this, eat, this eat out for eat out for half price, so the government picks up half the tax. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'll wrap up for, ten pound. Ten pound. Yeah, that's, 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 look for a meal for a meal meal. That sounds that sounds that sounds pretty reasonable to me. Yeah. Um, so I think um, uh, some of the restaurant chains, uh, the guy that runs Meat Liquor, um, he was saying that this is the fan most fantastic week he's had. It's up on last year. Um, the guy that runs um, Frank Amanka and the Little Greek, um, uh, uh, David Gray, he was saying the same thing. He said, in 12 months, I've never seen a restaurant so busy. So I'm just really encouraged by something that I said to you a few weeks ago when I was in London stuck on my own, that sort of community spirit that existed, you know, within the local restaurants or the, yeah. or the, the restaurant that turned into the green grocer, you know, which I thought was fabulous. And I hope then, I said to you at the time, Chris, on the podcast, our listeners, I really hope that people continue to use, you know, the restaurant as, um, uh, as they have done them. And all, there's all the examples across the, across the UK and Europe about the people going on. And it's fabulous to see that this is still going on. And so, you know, hats off to them. Um, I would like to see a return to international travel. I mean, this week we've seen again, nonsense, you know, Italy, Italy saying to Ryanair that they're not compliant with COVID-19 regulations and you know they'll 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 bar them from flying to Italy. We've seen the likes of Delta in the States take it one step further, saying, you know, so from having you know a, a very sort of light touch mask policy that we we're talking about before, you know, it recommended. Now they're all mandatory. And now they're not letting you use one of the ones with an exhaust valve. So yeah. they said, well, you've got to have a fully enclosed mask. So say, Right, look, are we actually just trying to make things too difficult for people? We've now got other countries saying, well, you've got to social distance on the aircraft and keep the middle seat free. Alan Joyce responded to that and said, well, if we, if we want 22 passengers, 108, 160 seat aircraft, sure we can do that, but we ain't going to fly anywhere. So no, that's not happening. Um, we've had the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, come out this week with a fantastic report around, around aviation, COVID-19 spread in aircraft. Very well worth a read um, to our listeners. So, I saw it on the Bloomberg, uh, but you probably find it at the MIT Review or, or, or um, on the MIT site, so I'm getting confused with the Harvard Review, but MIT have done some, some good work there. We've seen the likes of the extension of the, of the free insurance that Emirates were doing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, 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 now being applied by the Canary Islands. So the, the, uh, the, the um, Islas Canarias has offered, the, 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 um, the regional government is offering free insurance to travellers. COVID-19. Yep. So we're seeing more and more innovative things coming out. I just hope that continues. This resurgence of the second wave, let's, let's not call it a second wave really. Let's, let's just ensure that people are smart, wear their masks, comply, airlines mandate masks and airports mandate masks for travel and testing, testing, testing is the way I, I suspect will, will, will help immensely. Yeah, and Germany, Germany offering uh, passengers, you know, if they present a boarding car and everything, they can have a free COVID test. Fabulous, and and, and, and and yeah, there was another another example this week around um, the we've seen some positive signs. The Goldman Sachs um, report, uh, not a not a bank that I use <laughs> regularly, um, <laughs> but um, Goldman Sachs had reported that they believe certainly the um, the combination of the Oxford University trials with yeah. AstraZeneca in the UK was having very strong. And there's, there was a piece in the um, piece that Goldman Sachs put out this week suggesting that, um, that we'll have widespread uh, vaccination capability uh, within 12 months. So I'm a skeptic on that, as you know, Chris, because we can't get everybody still vaccinated against polio and typhoid and the like, but uh, we expect 7 billion people to be vaccinated against coronavirus. No, 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 but at least, at least, at least the, the, you know, the people that are having so much taken away from their life because they're in certain groups and they're a bit... Yeah, they, they, that's right, they, yeah. If they focus it correctly, and help yeah. those people to get back on track and into the main line or main the, 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 the at risk categories. Yeah. That's the yeah. most important. That's the most important. Yeah. important. And yeah. please God, hopefully they'll be able to do that in less than a year. Well, I'd like to think so. I, I, I quite like the old normal person. I'm not really, I'm not really a fan of this new normal, but, um, but hey ho. No, but it, it, it needs to be done. It needs to be done. Now, you mentioned about, you know, some positive results and you mentioned Ryanair there as well, but Ryanair and our own, our own, it would appear to be favourite. Wizz Air have come up with some good. Uh, you've got to get older, Joseph. He's got to start doing something for this show. I, I, I need to. I need to. I need to get to send him a message. Yeah. You've got to get Joseph, him on here. I think. Joseph, we're, we're, if you're listening, we need you. We need you on this podcast because you yes. get a name check every week almost. 
Yeah, and everybody, every, everybody. I've had so many people ask me how long have I been working for Wizz Air? <laughs> but they've done well, Steve. You know, their results have come in good. Things. Yeah, absolutely. I did, did you see the news this week? They were saying about the, um, uh, you know, they, they thought it was now inappropriate that the, that the moratorium on the slot rules should, should be maintained. Yeah, yeah. So they're basically saying, look, you use it or we will. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and look, fair play to them. Yeah, no, 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 that's right. And that's why, like with the US, with, with care and everything, it's important. It's important that, um, you know, everybody keeps keeps doing it, keeps it available. And even now with, with Spain, with the uh, quarantine, there's still plenty of flights available. So people are still taking it up and they're willing to do the 14 days or the 10 days, whatever it will be by the time they fly. And it makes sense to keep doing it because if, yeah. we, don't, if we don't, it's just gonna. It's just gonna be worse. Yeah, I think there was there was a there was a comment this week from the Austrian airline CEO. Um, uh, I can't remember the chap's name, but the uh, Austrian CEO said, um, "Look, let let's make if you want to do one thing for industry. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but if you want to yeah, do yeah. one thing that um, uh, you know that will that will have a, the biggest effect in in our view. And remember, Austrian's part of the Lufthansa Group, so yeah, yeah. everything everything that he says, I suspect, is is very well vetted." By your ex-German paymasters, um, yeah. uh, and rightly so. And um, you know, he said, "Let's make testing mandatory, not travel bans." Yeah. So I think what you said there is pitch up with a test, pitch up with a test, pitch up with a boarding pass. We'll give you a test, um, and off you off you pop. The the key is to get that test and the management in terms of time scales and, and exactly and, you know, timing. So let you know, sub thirty minutes seems to be seems to be one of the um, one of the uh, the decent, uh, decent test, but because they, these tests in private clinics are still prohibitively expensive. Yeah, So exactly. what we need to do is get is get large scale volume, um, and that that would be that would be good help. The one thing I saw just talking about quarantine this week as well was, of course, the changing regulations now in the UK, Chris. So yeah. what was previously what was previously possible was not. And I'm pleased to add that Malaysia has now been added to not only the safe travel corridor in terms of the FCO advice for travel to Malaysia, but I no longer require quarantine when I return to the UK. Isn't that, so, isn't that a treat? So excellent news on Malaysia. Well done to Malaysia. They've done a wonderful job here. We've only had, sad as it is, 140 deaths in Malaysia. So with a population of 30 million, that's, that's pretty good going for us, I think. Um, but we all, we all wear masks. We conform. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which we spoke about that. a long time ago. But anyhow, we can't, it's, it's not about we told you so. But, no, um, no, no, no. Who, who are we to tell anyone, Chris? Ig Exactly, as I keep being reminded. The only, the only thing I would tell you is that shirt, uh, you, you, you confirmed to one of, one of Skylight Aviation's long-standing customer airlines, Kath Gregory at Qantas Airways, that yep. the shirts would be toned down. This is, this is toned down. I think we'll leave that to Kath to decide. Yeah, this is toned down, my friend. Now, <laughs> talking about toning down, I've had so many people now saying how much they've been using e-commerce and several of the companies okay however there's a lot of people now saying that the success is actually contributing now to the demise of so many and so much that was so important in most of our cultures cottage industries smaller organizations you know a little bit of flair and competition and the sheer magnitude and size, it's almost as if, without going into names, they can turn around and say, I am going to do whatever it is. It might be Stephen and his sunglasses t-shirts. They're great, they're yours, Stephen, but you know something, we're going to do it. And if you don't sell out to us or if you don't support us, well, tough, because we'll do it anyhow. And I just think there needs to be a little bit more of a, I don't know, a, a little, a little bit of rebalancing and even the big boys now, they should actually want. It's, I think it's a little bit like the Premiership Football Club, uh, Football League. It's all well and good having the Premiership and Championship, but there's people who like to go and see their local clubs and like to see it from the grassroots yeah, coming yeah. up. And I think that's the sort of approach now that they should take, so that they're seen to be supporting certain niche, niche industry, niche groups, and not not destroying it all. Well, it's a bit, 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 a bit more Brentford rather than rather than Arsenal. Is that the sort of? Uh... Oh, I was so gutted with Brentford when Brentford didn't. Oh my goodness me! I'm still, I, I still, can't, still, I still upset. can't go. 
So, so, such a shame. I mean, Fulham um, played well, fair play to them, but, but it was such a shame. To be so close. Close, I know. Yeah, before. after so long, Chris. After yes. so long. And, you know, and, and yeah. Sorry, I didn't realise I was going to touch a, touch a raw nerve there, but um, soft spot. I know you've got a soft spot for Brentford. I think you've always had done, haven't you? Yeah, there's hope. There's hope still. So, but such a shame. Look, 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 I guess the reality of the global world is that is that there are global there are there are benefits of global purchasing parity, which yep. is clear. Let me explain to anybody. Um, so, uh, it, it would be. It, I mean, it, I think it to be expected that that these large large um, aggregators, call it if you like, or consolidators. Yep. Um, uh, will be will be on the hunt um, continually for opportunities. Now, what I've always found is that actually some of these little little. I mean, I remember doing some work in Nigeria back in two thousand and nine. I worked with a great little company there. It's called Red Star Express uh, Logistics and Forwarding Firm. And a magic magic fellas, smart, capable, keen. You know, I remember the guy um, uh, Shina. His name was Shina Lajuran. Fantastic guys, and I really enjoyed working with them. Um, and I, I could compare it to my experience of some recent work we've done for some of the, the bigger boys in the forwarding space, not, not, not in the e-commerce bit specifically. Yeah, yeah. And it, as you know, Chris, it's, it's, it's slightly more painful, it's slightly more bureaucratic, it's slightly more slower. However, I think that everybody over this, this last five months has had to pick up the pace when it comes to agility. And I think I'd be most impressed. And actually, here, here's an opportunity for some of the, the smaller cottage industries, you say, the smaller guys. To probably actually put, you know, test test their metal when it comes to, to service provision, looking after the customers better, yeah, you know, get yeah. a better bang for your buck, find a little niche that works for them. And if I look at it here in Malaysia, Chris, we had, you know, rubber. Rubber is our biggest export in Malaysia. Rubber and palm oil. I'm not a fan of palm oil. It's another political debate which we'll stay well aware of. But but palm oil is very bad for for the environment and for for wildlife habitats. Um, but rubber, so. Eight of the top 10 companies in Malaysia now are the large rubber firms, Hard to Lega, Top Glove, et cetera. Why is that? Because of nitrile gloves. Yeah. So during this crisis, they've yeah. gone from being relatively small, no, not small players, but I mean, Top Glove is the largest rubber player in the world, but their market capitalization has gone through the roof. So, I mean, these, are, these, are, these were small companies that have been given an opportunity because of COVID. Yeah. And now, now sitting up there in the top 10 companies in Malaysia, and Malaysia is not a tin pot country. I mean, we're, we're a decent sized economy and, you know, pretty, pretty strong player in the ASEAN, ASEAN uh, region. And so that's really great to see. My point is that just because you're small today and you're one of these smaller guys today, doesn't always mean you'll get swallowed up by the big boys. Actually, what it means is find your opportunity and, and really bloody go for it. And actually, you can see that these guys can, can do something really well. So I think, um, you know... Um, Look, e- e-commerce is only, go- is only going to grow, Chris. It's only going to get bigger. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, um, that's and clear. I think, I think what we, I think what we have to do also is get better, get better at e, at e-commerce. Uh, you know, smalls as we call it. Yes, in the, in the yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Smalls yeah. handling, because smalls handling is a pain in the backside for yeah. the most part. And so I think there's a lot of work to be done by the terminals and the and the forwarders and the distributors themselves or the or the agents because um, actually handling smalls can be can be quite problematic. Uh, and also, when you look at some of the guys, we can name check this one, Amazon, on their turnaround times, their delivery times in the UK. I mean, when I'm in London, I can order it 1 p.m. and it's on my doorstep at 9 p.m. Logistically, that is, that is I mean, bloody brilliant. Oh, it's um, phenomenal. I can't, I can't that, do that here in Malaysia. So there are markets that work really well and the infrastructure supports it, but there are markets that doesn't. Anyway, I'll be quiet now. I know we've gone over, yeah. but... Um, no, 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 but, but, but coming back to it now and coming back to the recovery club principle and getting smaller groups, what, what I'm trying to say is that, yes, of course it's going to go and it's going to go crazy and people now have to start getting more involved so there's more options. Otherwise, the big guys, and fair play to them, what they're doing is that's their strategy and tactics. They're very successful. But I think they must also take a step back and say, do you know something? It's happy to have somebody in the first division, the second division, the third division, because without that, there'd be no, there'd be no, um, you know, fun in the FA Cup or whatever it is. You need to, you need to have that, that, that you know, that. Chris, maybe, that maybe, that, well, maybe that goes back to your, your idea about the, sort of the cooperatives. Yes. You know, so, so a large, a large sponsor, not necessarily swallowing up or eating up or merging or acquiring, but actually working with and trying to get some common standards because it, it's not possible 
that, that, that the big guys can serve everywhere. Actually, there are yep. some really good local niche players that do that very well. So I think more partnerships potentially is the way forward here. I see that as being... Yeah, perfect. and that's a big thing. And that's something now definitely going to push. So if anybody out there is listening and wants to get involved, please feel free, get in touch. And um, and who knows, maybe it'll be the start of a, of a, of a brand new recovery. Blossoming, stuff. exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we've got to do it because it's so important to have options and choices. Yeah. Stephen, any little tip for this week? Anything that you'd like to throw out there as a nugget of, of wisdom? Um, no, no, no tips this week. Only to this is this. I'll show you this is uh, from my this is uh, some of my son made at school. Tip for me is don't leave your son's your son's um, uh, um, craft work from school anywhere near your thirteen week old puppy could potentially attack it. <laughs> yeah, but now you now you got the best of both there. But listen, Indeed. listen, look after yourself, my friend. Thanks a lot, and, Chris. Um, let's, let's, Have a good let's, week. Yeah, but listen, let's now genuinely try and, and put some of these things into, into practice and, and help some of the people out there. And for Indeed. anybody that is being displaced because of some tough decisions that have to be made, you know, it, as difficult as it is, keep strong and stay close to people that can support you and make sure you've got people that you can talk with. So good luck to everybody. Exactly. Good luck to the industry. Yeah. And um, we'll see you. We'll see you next week, Steve. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Chris. Cheers. Cheers. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. There's always a pearl of wisdom. Happy Sunday. <laughs>